Hello and welcome to the Domestic Cricket Podcast, where we discuss the latest news, big stories, player movements, fixtures, results, classic matches, and of course, interviews with domestic and international cricketers. So if you're a fan of the Sheffield Shield, One Day Cup, or a cricket fan in general, you'll love this podcast. I'm your co-host, Caleb Bland, along with Sam Fitzgibbon. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome back to the Domestic Cricket Podcast. Today we're joined by none other than Zimbabwe, uh, Zim- the former captain of the Zimbabwe national side, Graham Kramer. Uh, Graham uh, has played over 211, uh, over 144 uh, matches for Zimbabwe, picking up 211 international wickets. He's a right arm leg spinner. And Graham, it's uh, fantastic uh, to be speaking to you today. Thank you, Alan. Good to be in touch. Um, so take me back to where it began for you, uh, the start of your life. Uh, whereabouts uh, in Zimbabwe were you born? So I was born in Harare, um, in the capital, uh, but we lived in a small town called Kadoma for most of my upbringing. Uh-huh. And yeah, once I went to high school, that's when I moved into Harare. All right. And um, mm-hmm. how many siblings do you have? I have one older sister. Uh-huh. Yeah, she's two right. years older. Cool. Yeah. So uh, what was it like growing up in Zimbabwe uh, as a young child? Uh, it was a great upbringing, to be honest. Um, it's a good place to grow up. Um, I, there's so much to see. Like, there's a lot of nature, and it's not a fast pace of life generally. Um, yeah, so... Mine was mainly a farming community life. So, you know, a lot of outdoor stuff. Um, used to go to Kariba a lot on the lake. So, yeah, it was pretty good. Like, not that um, normal high life in, in town and stuff. We we're always in the outskirts. So, yeah, yeah pretty happy with how it, how it panned out. Yeah. And um, so... You went to uh, the prestigious Prince Edward High School in Harare. Uh, What are your uh, memories of uh, your high school life? Um, It was tough, to be honest. All boys school um, and first three years that I was there, I was a boarder. Mm -hmm. Um, It was real, it was real tough because there was, um, you know, seniors were real tough on the young ones and Yeah. yeah, but but it probably made everyone who they are today, Mm. you know, very respectful and, you know, respect your adults. Um, Yeah. I have fond memories of, of Prince Edward. Uh, I just remember from the first year how tough it was and then it just got easier and easier. And, you know, it was an amazing sporting school to be at. um, And I can thank them for, for the way I was brought up, to be honest. So how far uh, was it uh, to travel from your hometown uh, into uh, Prince Edward? Um, so it was, it was about 45 minutes drive. Oh, okay. So, yeah, not, not too far out of Berari. So would you, uh, uh, like, would you go home to your uh, family on weekends or just during school holidays? Yeah, so some weekends we were allowed to go out. Not every weekend, but then, yeah, school holidays mainly. Mm-hmm. We used to go out, yeah. And uh, you were obviously a, a fantastic cricketer for the school. Um, what was the cricket system like uh, over in um, 
Zimbabwe with the whole schools cricket system? Did you play against other uh, private schools or against um, a whole range of different schools? Yeah, we played against a whole lot of schools. So Prince Edward, although it was a renowned sporting school, it was mainly renowned for its rugby. Um, so cricket was probably second or third on the list. Um, we, yeah, we used to we used to play against pretty much every school in the country that was sort of um, you know. So we used to travel a lot and play. Um, I wouldn't say we had the best cricketing school or best cricketing team, but you know, we being at that school, it was you know they created that passion about like winning sporting games for your school. So like there was always a lot of pride that we took in, you know, when we went out onto the field and, you know, uh, we had a lot of great results. So yeah, it was, it was real good fun. And were there any uh, other um, professional rugby or cricketers that came from the school when you were there? Um, so, so Mark Vermeulen went to Prince Edward. Um, just Dave Mutendera went to Prince Edward. Um, I think back in the day, Nick Price went to oh, okay. Prince Edward. Mark McNulty went to Prince Edward. Yeah, there was there was quite a few. Um, maybe not as many cricketers as there were. Yeah. Oh, Graham went to Prince Edward. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Um, so you were only 18 uh, when you were called up uh, for your first match with Zimbabwe in a test match. Uh against Bangladesh. Um, do you feel like uh, you were too young or do you feel like you were ready uh, to be called up for that match? Uh, I suppose we had to get ourselves ready. We knew what what had happened with, uh, with the so-called rebels, um, you know, and we knew we were next in line and, you know, it was, it was tough because, like, there was basically no senior players in the team. There was just, you know, everyone sort of average age of 19, 20, which is always tough. So you had no one really to look up to. Um, and so had you been in the uh, underage system for Zimbabwe, uh, at the under-19 World Cups and such? Yeah, yeah. So I made the under-16s and then I went to two under-19 World Cups. Um, so that sort of prepares you for, for like tournament stuff. But... I mean, nothing will prepare you for, for a debut test match uh, at that age. But, you know, in, in saying that, um, you know, like you have to start somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, like, I'm happy that it, that it happened the way it did. Um, it, it just would have been nice to, to, like, get into the system and force your way in when, like, all the players were there. But... You know, it was just one of those things. Yeah. So were you, um, during those underage uh, kind of systems, were you ever coached by the likes of Heath Streak and Andy Flower or any of the greats of Zimbabwe? Yeah. So quite a lot of work with Paul Strang. Um, yep. I did. Um, Brian Murphy, I, I worked with them. Those players, so when I was at school, they were always in and around and, you know, the club, cricket system was really good then so we used to play with them a lot um so at least i got to got to be with them quite a bit um yeah. before everyone left so you know in that way the club system was really good and what was your experience like uh playing against bangladesh um age of 18 going to a foreign country um what was it like um how do you uh kind of feel like playing in front of a couple hundred people maybe in Zimbabwe uh, compared to a few thousand in Bangladesh? Yeah, it was, it was an experience. Um, leading up to the test match was like leading up to any tour or match or whatever. But then, you know, once the test match started, like I'd never heard noise like that on a cricket field. Um, so that was, you know, that just added to the nerves and everything. And that was that was something that like you get used to with time. Um, you know, even w during the second test, I, I still couldn't believe that they still cheer every ball yeah. and it was loud. You couldn't hear what the field that next to you was saying and stuff, you know, especially when Bangladesh were doing well. 
Yeah, so, and um, so I believe that was, that and uh, I believe that was their first test win. So I mean, obviously yeah. you uh, yeah. you lost, but it would have been a pretty cool experience being a part of that uh, history making day. Yeah, it was. I mean, like the the way they support their cricket, you know, it was. It was a good spectacle for us. I mean, we drew the second test, but so they obviously won the series. Um, but it was it was good to see how their crowd and their people followed the game, and you know they were they also um, you know celebrated good cricket. So if if even if we did something well, like they they would still clap and stuff. Yeah. Um, so they, yeah, they follow good cricket, which is great. And then one of your next test matches was against South Africa uh, with uh, the likes of Graham Smith, Jacques Callis, A.B. de Villiers, the legends of South African and world cricket, really. Um, mm. Although you went for 86 runs off uh, nine overs, you are, were you glad to pick up the wickets for three of those men? Yeah. Um, so, again, it was, it was tough to expect um, or what to expect because, like, you watch Test cricket on TV, and you know they they very conservative when they're playing and stuff. And then, you know, where, when they knocked us over early, I, I think it was 52 or something. Um, they basically saw blood and they went for it. Um, so they came out really attacking, and it was and it was tough for us because. Um, you know, in the morning, the ball moved around a bit. And then in the afternoon, like it sort of flattened out. So it was, it was tough to, to bowl. It was, the ball wasn't spinning or seeming much. Um, so it was tough for the bowlers. And I mean, they just, they just came pretty hard, but it was, it was good to pick up, you know, three big wickets. Um, and I think the only three wickets um, in the innings um, sort of makes you believe that, you know, maybe you do belong here. You can can get wickets at this level. So it was it was good for a self confidence point of view. So uh, it was a two match test series, and uh, South Africa beat you by an innings in both matches. However, at just the age of eighteen or nineteen, uh, you were the leading wicket taker for Zimbabwe in that series. Uh, was it a bittersweet feeling? Yeah, it was. Like I say, it's. Um, you know, like you, you sort of never, you know, walking out. I remember walking out that first test match and, you know, seeing the guy likes of Callis and Pollock and those guys. And these are my idols, like growing up and now I'm actually playing against them. Like you feel like you, you shouldn't actually be there because like the amount of experience and games that they've played. And then, you know, to actually do okay against them, you know, it just, it's a good um, self-confidence boost. And, and they were great after the test matches, you know, they would sit down with us and chat, you know, so, so that was always great. And I think it, it actually builds you as a cricketer, you know, to go through those tough periods um, and actually make it through. So is the relationship, um, obviously South Africa, the only other test playing African nation, is there a, pretty friendly relationship off field uh, generally with the South Africans? Yeah, generally. It's yeah. tough on the field. Um, like, they'll come as hard as they need to. Um, and the same with us. Um, uh, but off the field, yeah. like, they, like, they're great. Like, they're great guys. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. Now, just as you were um, finding your way in the Zimbabwe side, uh, you were... Uh, touted as a um, test match specialist, but unfortunately in the same year, 2005, uh, Zimbabwe uh, had a self-imposed uh, exile test cricket and they wouldn't play until 2011. Um, so how did that, how did that uh, affect you as a cricketer? And uh, yeah, what were your feelings and what did, what did you feel like you needed to do? Yeah, so that was tough, like, like not playing uh, so much longer version stuff. I mean, we still played our fourth, four day stuff back home, but I, I realized I need to get um, better in the shorter format and, you know, and, you know, it was more actually thinking a lot more in the one day stuff. Um, like the execution of the bowling was, was never really an issue. It was just 
going how to go about um, bowling 10 overs in a 50 over game. Um, and that came with experience, obviously, just playing locally. And finally got a chance and then never really looked back after that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it would have been a um, tough period for you. Um, it was about uh, seven, three or four years until uh, you finally broke into that white ball team, I think, in a Canadian T20 series. Um, so, yeah, what what um, were you doing back home in Zimbabwe Um like, were you fine-tuning your skills over those few years and um, talking to head coaches how to um, force your way into that side? Yeah, so, I, I mean, back then we still had a lot of cricket going on in the country. We, um, I was fortunate to be contracted 12 months or year-round. Um, so I played all the local stuff and, you know, it was just working with the likes of Ray Price and, and, you know, other spinners around, um, you know, and, and I always thought, like, it's going to happen. I just keep, you know, doing the right things and I'll eventually make my debut. And when I do, I'll make that count. And then, you know, hopefully I'll, because I, I could see, like, there's there's always room for a leg spinner in a, in a shorter format team. And, you know, I, I thought I was the best um, at that time and... I just needed other people to see that. Exactly. So uh, going back, um, you were discussing uh, that you were a twelve-month contracted cricketer. What's the uh, pay? What was the pay system like back in the uh, mid two thousands? Um, was it enough to earn a decent living? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so there was a grading system, but um, back then we were fortunate uh, that we were getting paid US dollars. Whereas the average yeah. person in Zimbabwe were getting paid local currency, so our salaries and stuff would go a, a long way, um, which made it a lot easier. And I'll say, yeah, definitely, it was it was enough to live and get by, and you know, maybe put some money away. Um, so yeah, it I was I was it was a, as a 18, 19, 20 year old, like you can't ask for much more doing what you love and you know, you could survive on, on what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. It would have been uh, excellent to be able to, you know, do something that you love as your career. Now, um, over the next few years, you were in and out of the uh, white ball side. Um, did this kind of inconsistency with your selection con uh, contribute to your decision to retire at the age of 27 uh, in 2013 to pursue a professional golfing career? Yeah, uh, there was there was a whole lot of things at that time. Like um, I, I didn't agree with a few things that were happening in and around some cricket. Um, I had like a knee injury that I was dealing with, um, you know, and and also like I just got I just got a bit tired of the game, like the the day in and day out training. Um, uh, yeah, I basically stopped enjoying it. Um, and it was the best thing, just being away from the game for about a year. Like, it was the best thing I could have done because when I came back, like, it was just like I fell in love with the game uh, all over again. Um, so I just needed that break, I think. I didn't know I was ever going to come back to it, but uh, I'm glad I did. And... Um... So how, how far did you get with your golfing career um, during that uh, break? Uh, well, I got down to um, scratch handicap and stuff. I never turned professional, um, but I always felt like it was something that I probably couldn't pursue in, in Zim. I would need to move. And then, you know, my wife was pregnant at the time and, it was just, just never the right time to, like, move anywhere. And, you know, it would be tough, like, to move somewhere and not where you know where you're going to end up, like, your career and stuff. So, like, I, I'm glad I, I went back to cricket, um, if I can say that. So uh, during that um, kind of uh, golfing period of your life, did you ever – uh, become uh, friends or mentored by Nick Price, who was obviously former world number one 
uh, golfer in the world, uh, obviously one of Zimbabwe's great exports. Were you uh, ever in contact with Nick? Uh, unfortunately not, um, because he lives in the, in the States. I think he lives in Florida. So like I was never in touch with him or never saw him actually during that time. Um, there was a lot of other pros around that I used to play with and, and stuff. Um, but yeah, it would have been great to, to like be in touch with someone like Nick you know, and pick his brain. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. So um, you made a uh, surprise return to many uh, to Zoom cricket in 2015. And uh, in the 2016 uh, India White World Tour of Zimbabwe, you were named captain. Uh, so what changed for you as a player now having the extra responsibility as captain? Did you change anything about the way you personally play your game? Uh, not really, but like you say, it just gives you that that responsibility. And in a way, it was it was a good thing for me because I, when I played as a player, I used to overanalyze things and put a lot of pressure on myself. So when I got the captaincy, I had to like take my thoughts away from myself and start thinking about the ten other guys that are on the field. Um, so it actually helped me in a way that. I know, like, I sort of switch on when it's my time to bowl, but then I forget about myself when when I'm sort of not involved. So it worked out quite nicely for me in that way. And Zimbabwe actually managed to uh, pull off a major upset against India under your captaincy. Uh, did that? Uh, how did, how was that experience for you? And did you feel like you really uh, cricket was really your calling from the beginning? Yeah, no, it was awesome. Like. Um, you know, to be to be captain where when that happened, you know, I mean, at, and the captain on the other side was Donny. So, you know, to to get one over him uh, with still quite a young, inexperienced side compared to them. I mean, they had a few players missing, but they they can easily make three international teams if they wanted. They have such huge depth, so. Just getting over the line at Rari Sports Club and, you know, in front of that crowd, like, it just keeps you going, like, for months and months down the line when you just think back and remember that. So, like, that's sort of what cricket is. Um, you know, you have a few good games or good series and, like, that keeps you going for a long time. Yeah, exactly. Um, so... Taking back, yeah, talking about that victory. So obviously in India, it made um, news headlines for all the wrong reasons um, for them. But what was it like in Zimbabwe? Is is a massive victory like that in Zimbabwe celebrated by an entire nation or just a small population that follow cricket? No, sport in general, when something like that happens, is celebrated all around the country. I mean, it's a small country. Um, people who weren't watching hear about it very quickly and, um, you know, the players get a lot of credit for that. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I would say like sport in general, the whole country will, will um, stand by their team, um, you know, when, they, when they're doing really well. So, yeah, it, it, was, it was great um, atmosphere in the, in the country after that happened. Yeah. Um, so sticking to 2016, uh, Sri Lanka came over uh, for a test in ODI series, I believe. Uh, and in the first test against Sri Lanka, some would say it was probably your finest moment in your career. Uh, although in a losing cause, you took four wickets uh, to help bowl Sri Lanka out for 537 in the first innings and then scored your maiden and only century in test cricket, uh, hitting a 270 ball 102 runs not out at number eight um, to help Zimbabwe avoid the follow-on. Uh, and then playing for the draw in the last innings of the match, managed uh, 43 runs of 144 balls. Now, this performance put you in elite territory, becoming only the seventh captain in the world uh, to take four wickets uh, and score a century in a match. Um, so do you feel like this was your finest individual performance? I think in an all-round game, um, especially, um, so I wouldn't really regard it as a as a, as a batsman. Um, so I'd always, well, 
in good games, like I do really well with the ball. But in this particular game, it was it was bittersweet because getting the hundred in the first innings, and then I felt second innings we still could have um, drawn the game, um, and I felt I played a. a I lost concentration. I played a loose shot to get out on 43. Otherwise, I, I still think back of that today and think like we should have drawn that test match. Um, yeah, so it, it was bittersweet. And I was still, you know, upset about, you know, how, how I got out. So, you know, it was, it was a, a great experience to get over the line and get a test match 100. Um, but still, like to to get out on forty three when, you know, we we could have, you know, ended up drawing that game was was tough at the end. Yeah. So, uh, the following year, Zimbabwe then to Sri Lanka, and uh, the Chevrons, uh, the nickname of Zimbabwe side, managed to pull off a great upset, defeating Sri Lanka in the one day series, uh, three games to two. Uh, where does that rank? Um, personally, uh, as your best moments uh, as the captain of the national side? Mm, yeah, that was def- definitely the hi- highlight of my career. Um, I think, um, you know, um, I felt I bowled, I bowled quite well in the, in, in the series and individually. I mean, I can't say that, like, I made a huge um, contribution to us winning that series. Um, but just as a, as a team and being captain like that, that was definitely the highlight of of my career, and it will always be. Um, you know, we had a great a great team spirit then. Um, we had Streaky as coach, um, and we put in a lot of work to try and get guys moving in the same direction. And we felt like we we had finally got there. Um, and you know, winning winning that series was, yeah, it was special for us. So obviously, it was a uh, pretty long away series, uh, especially for a white ball series playing five one days and the test match as well, which um, Zimbabwe also managed to be extremely competitive. Um, Sri Lanka had to pull off a record run chase um, to win that. But what's in a, a way to a uh, uh, consist of for a, a side like Zimbabwe? Like, uh, how like long um, do you spend in the country preparing for the first match or do you play tour matches? And what's what's in a way to uh, kind of consist of? Yeah, so on that particular tour, we didn't have a tour match. But generally, you would, you would I would say, you would r- arrive 10 days before the tour actually starts. Uh, you'll probably have one or two days to recover from from the flight and everything. So you'll probably be in the pool, maybe a bit of running, and then you'll be straight into nets, um, you know, and the meetings and analysis that goes along with it, you know, for the preparation. And then you might play one or two games to try and get everyone to get a hit and everyone to have a ball. And, yeah, so it's pretty full on once once you land um, till the time you leave. And as captain, um, what role do you play off field uh, in terms of, you know, selecting sides and uh, making game plans and tactics? Like, are you heavily involved or is that more pushed to the coaching panel? Yeah, no, heavily involved. So um, selection, how it worked was we had three selectors, Um we had Streaky and myself. So I was basically a consultant in the selection panel. Um, so me and Streaky would decide. And, and most of the time we, we would get the 11 that we would want um, on the field. Um, I'd say pretty much 90%, 95% of the time uh, we would get who we needed on the field because we were the, the ones always there watching nets like we can see people's form Uh, so yeah it it was it was good in that way Um, yeah and tactically you know we especially me and Streaky we would we would sit down quite often like before after sessions um, 
see where we're at and where we're at. And like we we had a we had a good relationship in that way. Like we respected what what each other thought, and you know I think it worked quite nicely. Exactly. So the following year uh, was a massive year for Zimbabwe cricket, uh, hosting the. 2018 ICC World Cup qualifying tournament uh, with the top two sides qualifying for the 2019 World Cup in England and Wales. What was the feeling like uh, in Zimbabwe uh, amongst the people um, that they were hosting such a tournament? And did you feel like cricket uh, was popular, like as popular in the nation as it was maybe back in the early 2000s when greats like Heath Streak and Andrew Flower were gracing the wicket? Yeah, definitely. There was definitely... um a buzz in the country surrounding like the qualifiers. People knew and people follow the game uh, a lot in Zim. So they, they know what's going on and they knew what was ex- at stake. Uh, they knew that there was a potential, a potential the cricket team could go, go to the World Cup, um, you know, in England. Yeah, so there was, a, there was a buzz in the country and like we could feel it as players. So obviously the ICC made a decision uh, probably around 2017 that they'd cut the uh, World Cup number of nations competing from 14 to 10. How how did that affect um, countries like Zimbabwe and probably Afghanistan and even the West Indies who are uh, probably deserve to be in a World Cup, but sometimes uh, it gets very competitive and it's probably unfair. Do you feel like it's unfair to cut uh, some teams out like Ireland and only have two places in that World Cup when maybe you could have four or six teams who are worthy of being there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there are definitely 14, 15 teams that should be at the World Cup and, and especially from an ICC point of view, like they, they're so big on growing the game and... Like uh, I think cricket is probably the only sport that that is cutting, you know, teams out of tournaments. Whereas like football and stuff is always growing. So, yeah, I I, I think for the ICC, I mean, they they need to keep that in mind. Where, like, you know, teams like Ireland, Sim, and whatever, if they don't make those World Cup um, tours and stuff, you know, they they're not going to get they're not going to get better. I mean, it's a it's a big, um, you know, arena to play in, um, in a World Cup, and you learn so much being there. So, like, cutting a few teams out, uh, I think, is not helping the game, and it's actually shrinking the game. Exactly. Uh, that's what I thought as well. Um, obviously, a massive Zimbabwe supporter. Uh, I was quite disappointed reading it, although I still had high hopes. Uh, you had a great team uh, at the time, and still do, obviously. Uh, obviously beating Pakistan just the other week. Um, so there's plenty of talent there, but, you know, you probably feel like Zimbabwe deserved to be there automatically just because not only are they a test-playing nation, but the amount of cricket history and the amount of great players that have come from there, you probably feel like they should probably automatically qualify. But, um, yeah, I guess it's the way it went. And you still had a job to do, and you played really well that tournament. Uh, a few massive victories along the way and crowds uh, were filling out the stadiums in Bulawayo and Harare and I actually remember a Zimbabwe v Scotland match having to be moved from I think it was uh, it might have been the old Harare sports club and it had to move it back to the major stadium just to accommodate for the massive crowds so you know there was a massive hype around it and Zimbabwe got to the latter stages of the tournament and uh, I think you needed to beat UAE uh, to make the tournament and obviously fell short by three runs. Um, what, what did that feel like for the group and yourself and I guess for the whole nation of Zimbabwe? What was the feelings like around that? Yeah, it was, it was a real low point um, when we didn't cross the line. Um, you know, we felt... We felt let down uh, in a way because we felt like, as a group, like we couldn't give any more. Um, we gave our best, like every game, and it was a lot of close games that we managed to win. And like uh, I attribute that to, or contribute that to, like the way the team had stuck together and everyone, 
knew that they needed to play their role in order for us to qualify. And then, you know, it's just unfortunate, you know, DL came into the equation in that game. And, you know, UAE, I mean, they, they played really well, you know, to, to score probably a pass score on that wicket. Um, and then they, they bowled nicely and to restrict us, like, also credit to them. Yeah. And uh, after the tournament, uh, you and the entire uh, uh, coaching panel, including Lance Kluzer and Heath Streak, uh, were dropped by Zimbabwe cricket. Uh, and then the following year in January, you relocated to uh, Dubai, where you are now, uh, to be with your young family. And I believe Myrna, your wife, is a pilot for Emirates. Yes. So yeah. um, how's it going over in Dubai at the moment? And what was... What was the transition like going from such a kind of rural-based country like Zimbabwe to a massive desert city like Dubai? Yeah, so the original plan was, so when my wife got the job, we thought, well, for stability and security for the kids, it'll be, it'll be better to be based in Dubai. Um, they can go to international schools. They'll be able to see... Uh, a lot more than we could show them living in Zim. Um, so that was the reason. And my plan was actually to live here and fly back and forth. Um, but I think w once we got here, we realized that that wasn't, that wasn't going to be the case because you know, my wife is always um, flying and stuff. And, uh, and the kids, everything is new for them. Um, I feel like they've probably just settled now two years later. So, you know, I still think we made the right call. Uh, her career is, you know, going to be way longer than mine. Um, so in that way, like we, we made that decision together and, you know, happy, happy that we did. So what's it been like uh, for the kids? Um, obviously uh, moving at a young age from Zimbabwe to Dubai. And um, uh, are they going to follow in your footsteps uh, going down a sporting path? Um, so so they, they enjoy Dubai. Like there's, there's a lot of things to do here that, that you would never get in, in Zim or, matter of fact, any, any other places around the world. Like this, yeah, there's so much for them. The security is amazing here in Dubai, um, and they love it. I mean, we all love love it here, um, you know. And so, right now, just me working at the Rajasthan Royals uh, Academy. I've got my oldest involved. He seems really keen. Uh, That's good. So, yeah. like, I'll, I'll let them choose that path. I won't force anything um, on them. Um, but I'll obviously be there to like help them and it makes it easier with me being involved with Academy to get them out there. And if that's what they choose and, you know, whether it's golf, tennis, uh, cricket, like uh, that'll be their choice. Like we won't force anything on them, but, you know, it'll be ni nice to keep them involved in some sort of sport, like yeah, exactly. when they're growing up. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you've looked into it, but do you know if, if they were to follow... Um, their cricket career path, would they uh, would they qualify to play for the UAE or would they still um, be eligible to play for Zimbabwe? Uh, so they'll still be, because uh, we all still Zimbabwe citizens and we none of us can get uh, UAE passports, so we'll always be Zimbabwe okay. passport holders. Um, they would probably qualify to play for both because once you've lived in uh, the UAE, I think it's four years, you can qualify to play for the UAE. But um, as long as you're holding a Zimbabwe passport, I think you can always go back and play for Zim. So it's good that they've got options. Yeah, and uh, I think I was reading somewhere the other day that you actually had a, uh, a role with the UAE cricket team a couple of years back uh, when they toured Zimbabwe, are you still involved uh, with uh, UAE cricket? Uh, no, not at all now. So it was when I first arrived, um, Dougie Brown was head coach um, and he wanted me to come down and, and just have a look at the guys and see if I could help out where I can 
where I could. So it was just a two month thing um, working with him. And unfortunately, uh, he lost uh, um, his job as head coach with the UAE. Um, but fortunate again, like he's involved with the Rajasthan Royals Academy. So I'm back with him again. So yeah, it's been good fun so far. So what's your, uh, your role with the Rajasthan Royals Academy for the listeners at home? Yeah, so I'm director of cricket there. Um, I basically run the program. Um, so more the operations of the, of the, of the nets and the, and the age group stuff. Um, yeah, we do the one-on-ones as well, but it's, it's mainly the group sessions that I, that I plan and take care of. So is that, uh, uh, kind of, uh, picking out and breeding the best uh, cricketers in the UAE and then potentially getting them a pathway into the IPL? I think the pathway is there definitely, but I mean, the, we, we don't pick anyone. Our programs are there and the structures are there. So parents basically just book their kids in. Um, and to be honest, like this, there's, there's so much talent here in the UAE, both, you know, um, no, and it's, I mean, it's all expats. So, you know, from Indians to Australians to English, um, they all come to the academy. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's great to work with them. And like hopefully in the future, we can say that guy playing in the IPL team, um, he was with us and we pushed him through and now he's playing IPL. So uh, while, while it's a possibility, like it'll, It'll probably be a while before any of the kids get to that level. So what's um, cricket like in the UAE? Obviously, they kind of um, have always been there uh, on the fringe of uh, the test playing nations. Um, so what's it like over there? Is there, uh, with the local um, uh, Emir- Emiratian, I believe you would call them? Uh, Emirati- so uh, is it more locals? Is there an interest in cricket with the locals or is it more the expats, like you were saying before, the Australians, the Indians, uh, who uh, are the majority of people participating in cricket in the UAE? I think um, it's probably 99% expats. Um, yeah. It's not a lot of locals that uh, play cricket, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know what the reason is. I mean, I, I suppose in... In the Middle East, it's not a big sport. Um, so it's basically all expats who are bringing the game into the UAE. And it's big here. I heard something like in a given week, there's over a million people playing cricket, you know, whether it's, you know, in the desert or at any, any of the grounds around the UAE. So cricket is definitely big here. It just it just needs to get supported a bit a bit more, I think, by by government and businesses. And you know, it'll be it'll be great because they've got all the facilities. You've got um, the Dubai Stadium, uh, International Cricket Stadium, which is amazing. Um, got nice stadiums in Abu Dhabi, Sharjah. So facilities are here. It just needs to be pushed a bit more, I think. So uh, when the uh, T20 World Cup qualifying uh, tournament was held in the UAE, I think March last year, um, was there much talk about it uh, around the country? And did you uh, get involved or go to any matches or anything like that? Uh, No, um, there wasn't much, to be honest. Um, I wasn't involved in in any way at that time. I think UAE team, I think Robin Singh had just taken over then. Um, I don't know him, so I wasn't involved in any, any way. I didn't watch any games, but I was following it. So, yeah. 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 But it, it wasn't, it wasn't like extremely well advertised. Um, so I don't think a lot of the general public knew it was actually happening. Yeah. Well, it's been brilliant chatting to you, Graham. Um, I, like so many other diehard Zimbabwe supporters and cricket fans in general, have loved watching you play over the years uh, representing Zimbabwe. Um, now, you've never officially ruled out uh, returning uh, to the national team. Uh, obviously, we're still considering flying in and out. Uh, can you put that to bed now? Or is it still uh, up in the air whether you'll uh, ever potentially return to the national side? 
I think if the option was there, um, I'd love to play again. Uh, it would just need to make sense um, for myself and the family. Um, but I definitely haven't ruled it out. Um, I still try and play in uh, tournaments here, here and there where, where, where I can. I'm hoping to play in the T10 end of January. So like I'd, I'd still like to keep playing. And if the option came up to, to play for Zim again, um, whether it be a World Cup or you know, a couple of test matches or whatever. Like, I'd, I'd definitely like to put on the red jersey again at some stage. Um, yeah, so we'll see in the future. Well, yeah. it's, um, it's been excellent talking to you, especially a player of your calibre, an international test one day T20 captain. Just going through some of these stats, um, 540 test runs, 744 one day runs, 68 T20 runs. Uh, 57 test wickets at an average of just 16, uh, 119 uh, ODI wickets uh, with a six-wicket haul in there and 35 T20 wickets. Um, and you're also the first Zimbabwe captain to take a five-wicket haul in an inning. So, you know, it's been really cool chatting to a player of your calibre and uh, hope everything uh, continues to go well in your future. And um, thanks for having us on the Domestic Group podcast. Mm, thanks, Caleb. It was good to chat. Uh, you keep well.